their organ systems that uh, may lead to unusual responses uh, to propofol. Um, it's very important to uh, establish that the patient's medical condition is stable, that is, there's nothing, um, uh, re no recent changes um, in their medical condition. Um, it's important to establish their airway. Are, are they at risk to an airway obstruction, for example, obstructive sleep apnea, um, a short mandible, a short neck, um, patients that may be morbidly obese. Um, so the airway is, is very important. Um, to establish uh, any other factor that could accentuate the um, cardiorespiratory depressant effects of propofol, for example, chronic medications, cardiovascular medications uh, used to treat um, arrhythmias, hypertension, and similar uh, cardiovascular disorders. And airway obstruction and cardio uh, cardiorespiratory depression uh, are two of the most common risks associated with propofol, wouldn't you agree? Um, I guess it depends. I mean, there are many risks and complications associated with propofol. It causes burning when injected into veins. Um, but certainly the most serious, I wouldn't say the most common by any means, uh, airway problems are fairly unusual with propofol because it, per se, unless you give very large doses or administer a dose very rapidly, it's associated with uh, respiratory stability. Patients generally breathe spontaneously um, and uh, rarely um, experience apnea unless it's combined, for example, with an opioid or a narcotic analgesic. In those situation is when, situations is when we most commonly see uh, the respiratory complications. Um, also, uh, other uh, benzodiazepines, of course, correct? Benzodiazepines tend to have more of an additive effect. Uh, narcotics affect what we call CO2 responsiveness. Normally, when your carbon dioxide level goes up, your ventilation increases. When you have narcotics present, that response is blunted. Um, with sedative hypnotics like propofol and benzodiazepines, um, they affect more the hypoxic response. That is, as your oxygen saturation declines, your ventilation increases. So that when you combine opioids or narcotics and sedative hypnotics, you get a much greater uh, depressant effect on ventilation uh, because they affect different uh, components of the respiratory drive, if you will, or different arms. Dr. White, to date, uh, how much have you been paid by the defense for your involvement in this case? Um, I think I was told I've been paid about 11000 um, I got a check recently which uh, has not been deposited as yet. And, and how much do you expect to be paid uh, upon completion of all your work in this case? Um, I guess if they have money, um, I think they have limited financial Objection, resources. Objection, non-responsive. Sustained. Motion is stricken. Disregard. Listen carefully to the question. You may ask it, please. How much do you expect to be paid uh, in total upon completion of your involvement in this case? <clears throat> that, that's vague and ambiguous regarding expectations versus actuality. Well, I'm going to sustain the objection to the characterization expect to be paid. Uh, I think you can rephrase the question. How much have you? How much do you expect to be receive in compensation for your involvement in this case? The same question. You Sustain. Remember. You've received. Uh, you have an agreement to receive payment following uh, your testimony in this case. No, I do not. Is it your testimony under oath that the only money you're receiving is eleven thousand dollars? To date, that's correct. I, it might be eleven thousand to two hundred. I I really don't know. My wife handles uh, all my. Finances. Is it your testimony that that amount uh, represents the total compensation you are going to receive from the defense for your involvement in this case? I can't say that with, with certainty. There are certainly some other expenses, uh, airline trips uh, between Los Angeles and San Francisco that I would hope to be reimbursed for. Other than reimbursement, uh, for your time, specifically for your time, is it your testimony under oath? that the only compensation you're going to receive in total for your time put in this case is $11,000? I hope I receive some compensation for all the time I've spent in the courtroom. Okay. And how much compensation are you going to request? 
Well, uh, normally, you want to know how much I charge normally for court appearances? Sure. Uh, about $3,500 a day. Okay. But I have not billed them that amount because I don't think they have those resources. And you've sat here throughout the testimony of Dr. Steinberg, Dr. multiple days of Dr. Kamengar. Uh, you've been here for hearings. You were here for all of Dr. Schaefer's testimony. Uh, I believe you've been here at least 10, 11, 12 days uh, about that number. Does that sound about accurate? Um, I think that's about right. I think six days as an observer. And, and, and that's $3,500 a day for all those days? I stated that that is what I'm normally paid, but I have not billed them. Are you uh, going to bill them $3,500 a day uh, for those 12 days, yes or no? No. Now, have you ever had a patient um, stop breathing after you administered propofol? When I administer propofol for induction of anesthesia, um, the idea is to get them at a deep level of anesthesia so that you can insert um, an airway device um, like a, in, a tracheal tube or a laryngeal mask airway. And in those cases, you may see very transient uh, apnea. Dr. But, White, I, I asked, have you ever had a patient stop breathing after you administered propofol? Yes or no? I guess the answer is yes. Okay. And what did you do to remedy the situation? When they stop breathing, I um, may assist their ventilation with a bag and mask, or I may, if I'm planning to insert an endotracheal tube, I will perform a laryngoscopy uh, and tracheal intubation. Um, if I'm planning to insert a superglottic device, which is a device that does not go into the trachea, it's just above the glottis, like a laryngeal mask airway or LMA device, I will insert it at that time. So you've been able to manage uh, the complication when someone has stopped breathing as a result of a propofol uh, administration, correct? Yes, as I stated, I always... You answered the question, thank you. Can you explain for me uh, how you would characterize the doctor-patient relationship? Well, a doctor-patient relationship involves um, having a responsibility for a patient, having an understanding of the patient's um, medical diseases and conditions, and showing compassion for the patient. and. Uh, uh, doing your best to meet their health care needs. And do you agree that a, a doctor has a, uh, a solemn obligation to first do no harm to the patient? Absolutely. Do you feel that administering, would you agree that administering propofol in the two months prior to Michael Jackson's death, uh, violated that oath to do no harm? As I recall, in the previous six weeks, there was no harm. So I, I guess I would... So you look at it after the fact, and if the patient's still alive, then the doctor did a good job? Is that how you analyze it? No, you ask if he did harm to the patient. No, I said, do you think he violated that oath? the oath being to do no harm. I think he was providing a service to Mr. Jackson, which he uh, had requested, in fact, insisted on. Provided He provided a service, correct? That was your word. I said he provided, uh, well, medical care. Let's choose that as a better word than a service. That's but, a better word than the one you used? Well, it's, it's I think, a more appropriate choice of words, yes. He was offered money to provide propofol on a nightly basis, correct? Based on Conrad Murray's own interview with the police. It's my understanding that he wasn't paid any money. I didn't ask you that, did I? You have to be very closely attentive to my questions, okay? Please, Dr. White. Um, I will try, thank you. Conrad Murray was offered money to provide Michael Jackson propofol on a nearly nightly basis, per Conrad Murray's own statement to the police, correct? I believe that may be correct, yes. Okay. 
he was offered money to provide a service, the provision of propofol, correct? My understanding is he was offered money to be Michael Jackson's private physician and to be essentially to have Michael Jackson as his sole patient. Who's the final decision maker when it comes to making medical judgments in the doctor-patient relationship? Is it the patient or the doctor? I think it's a shared responsibility. Who's the final decision maker? If there's a conflict in, uh, say, the patient requests something that the doctor thinks would be harmful uh, and is not medically indicated, uh, is the doctor supposed to just do whatever the patient says? Well, the, the physician always has the option to walk away from the patient. That's correct. And so you, Dr. White, if you were asked to provide uh, inappropriate medical care that you thought was harmful to the patient uh, and the patient insisted upon it, uh, would you walk away? I would never um, administer what I consider to be inappropriate medical care to any patient. Okay, so is that answer yes, you would walk away if they insisted upon it? Yes. Thank you. Now, why is there a need for the continuous observation of individuals when they're uh, sedated or anesthetized by propofol? Well, I think a, a major reason is if you're providing sedation, it's very easy, as we've discussed, to go from one level of sedation to another, either deeper sedation, closer to anesthesia, or lighter sedation. You can also have a situation where the effects are wearing off and you may uh, have a patient who's wide awake because propofol has a very short duration of effect uh, when you turn it off. And for that reason, this what you refer to as a continuum of sedation, uh, that's one of the reasons why you need to have constant monitoring of the patient, correct? When you're administering an infusion um, or repeated uh, bolus injections, uh, yes, that's correct. Was well, it your testimony that if you inject someone, uh, let's say with just 25 milligrams of propofol, is it okay to then just walk out of the room and leave that person alone without any monitoring equipment? My testimony is that giving a 25 milligram dose of propofol will have minimal effects lasting less than 15 minutes. So if a patient is observed for 20 or 30 minutes after a single dose, um, I see no reason why one cannot leave their bedside. Uh, as I mentioned, okay. there's, there are studies giving small doses for pre-medication before patients leave a... Well, and those studies, to be uh, fair and accurate, uh, you don't look at just the dose, you look at the effect on the patient, correct? Because the effect varies from patient to patient, correct? Absolutely, correct. Okay. So when you keep saying the dose, uh, you have to also look at the effect. Would you agree? Yes, and that's why I stated, sir, that you monitor the patient for at least 15 minutes after even a small dose because this patient, a given patient, may have an exaggerated response. And then after 15 minutes, it's okay to walk out of the room and leave them on their own. Is that your testimony? I'm saying that if I give a small dose of propofol, that is a minimal sedating dose, 0.4 milligrams per kilogram, and I observed the patient and saw no untoward effect for 15 to 30 minutes is what I said. I said I'd, a minimum of 15 minutes, but ideally, observe the patient for a half hour, I, I would see uh, no problem in leaving the patient's bedside. And that would be in a clinical setting? Medical hospital, office suite, something of that nature, correct? That's the only setting in which I've given the drug, so right. yes. But even in that setting, uh, it's your testimony that you would in inject a patient, uh, and I want you to assume they're not hooked up to any monitoring equipment whatsoever. Uh, there's no personnel in the room. You would inject them with 25 milligrams of propofol, watch them for 30 minutes, and as they continued to sleep, you would leave them alone without any monitoring equipment or people on hand? Is that what you would do? 
In the hospital setting, as we discussed earlier, typically they have an EKG running. They typically have a pulse oximeter on a finger. Um, so I wouldn't characterize it as no monitoring. Having a pulse oximeter in place it represents uh, monitoring equipment. So, Well, if you're in the room, if you're out of the room and it doesn't have an alarm, it really doesn't represent anything, does it? Well, it depends where you're, you know, you can observe. Um, but I think that... Well, if you can't see it and you're out of the room, a pulse oximeter without an alarm means absolutely nothing. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, I don't agree that it means nothing. Um, what value does it have? If, if you're out of the room, you can't see it, and it has no audible alarm, and no one else is there, what value does a pulse oximeter have with no alarm? Well, if, if you've observed the patient for a period of time and the pulse oximetry value, the saturation is stable, um, we know that propofol in a 25 milligram dose will have effects that last maybe five minutes, maybe seven and a half minutes, um, and beyond that, virtually no effects. So if you've observed them for 25 or 30 minutes, I think you can, you can certainly move away from the bedside. Okay, that wasn't my question. My question is, I'm asking about a pulse oximeter without an alarm. Uh, if you are not there to see it, to see the little tiny screen, and you're not there to hear it, uh, it doesn't even have an alarm, what value does it serve? Well, only what, in your absence, what value does it serve in your absence? In your absence, it probably has little, if any, value. None, correct? correct? Well, yeah, that's true. Okay, it has no value, correct, if you're in, not in the room? Um, correct? Correct, yeah. Thank you. And 25 milligrams of propofol, uh, which you keep referencing, of course, uh, assumes no other benzodiazepines are on board, right? It, it Certainly no acutely administered benzodiazepines. If they've been administered hours before, they would probably have very little, uh, if any, effect. But they could have an effect. They could have a, 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 an effect dependent on the time interval between the administration of the last dose of the benzodiazepine and the dose, a small dose of propofol. Well, would that influence, if you knew uh, that a patient had, and I'm talking about you personally, if you knew a patient had lorazepam and midazolam on board and you gave 25 milligrams of propofol, would you still just walk out of the room after observing them for 15 to 30 minutes? Or would that be something that would uh, raise your awareness to maybe pay a bit more attention? I, I still feel that that is adequate. In particular, if the 25 milligrams of propofol is administered over three to five minutes very, very slowly, that represents a very slow dose that would not be expected to achieve a very uh, high peak level. So you, again, my question was, would you, uh, knowing that benzodiazepines were on board, uh, and you administered 25 milligrams and the person uh, uh, had not woken in your 15 to 30 minutes of observation, would you be comfortable then leaving them alone without any monitoring equipment? Yes or no? I said it depends on the time interval between the last dose of midazolam and the slow bolus injection of propofol. So w would the fact that you knew benzodiazepines were on board in any amount alter your level of care? I would certainly uh, observe the patient uh, carefully as I would even if it was just propofol alone. But just for 30 minutes? I think 30 minutes is certainly adequate for a slow 25 milligram bolus dose of propofol even in a patient who has hours earlier received um, a small dose of midazolam or lorazepam, yes. And that would be accept the acceptable standard of care to administer midazolam and lorazepam and 25 milligrams of propofol. And with the patient not being hooked up to any monitoring whatsoever and no staff on board, it would be appropriate for you to walk out after 30 minutes. Is that your testimony? Are you asking me about the standard of care or the standard practice? I'm asking about the standard of care. Would you, and I'm asking about you personally. Well, the standard of care is ultimate or most ideal standard of care. And 
obviously the standard of care would require monitoring, as I've suggested earlier. Okay, so you, is that then that you would not leave that patient alone without any monitoring or any staff to make sure that they're safe? You well, would not do that, is that correct? I would observe the patient for a period of time. If, if this was an unusual case because you were, the, the doctor was trying to achieve um, a sleep, allow the patient to uh, achieve a sleep state. So I think that uh, once the patient was, was resting apparently comfortably and had been observed for a period of time such that the risk of either respiratory or cardiovascular adverse effects um, had passed, it's not unreasonable to leave. The, it certainly is done in practice if you're giving a small dose uh, on a one-time basis. Um, it's quite different than a situation where you're giving an infusion or repeated doses, then it would absolutely be unacceptable. What if in your mind uh, you had previously made statements that the patient likes to push the propofol themselves? Uh, would that change uh, your willingness to just simply walk out of the room and leave them alone with no monitoring? It would certainly uh, make me careful about um, allowing access to drugs. Would you walk out of the room uh, and leave them alone with no personnel and no monitoring if you're of the opinion they like to push propofol themselves? Would you walk out of the room in that situation, yes or no? I wouldn't, no, I would not leave the room. Thank you. You can't justify uh, Conrad Murray's failure to call 911 uh, in the period of time or in the waiting uh, essentially 20 minutes to call 911, can you? No, I cannot. That's an extreme deviation from the standard of care, wouldn't you agree? Again, uh, these classifications are not familiar with me. I would say that given the fact that Dr. Murray is a cardiologist who is um, certified in advanced cardiopulmonary life support. Objection assumes facts, not in evidence. Overall, you may finish your answer. Life's Did he act like someone who was uh, well skilled in advanced cardiac life support? Did he act like that? I was not present to make that assessment, sir. You've uh, taken all his statements as true in your assessment, correct? I wouldn't necessarily say I've taken all his statements as true, no. Do you think from your review of his statement to the police that he acted like someone who was well skilled in advanced cardiac life support? I think Dr. Murray upon returning to Michael Jackson's bedside and finding him apparently in cardio, full cardiopulmonary arrest probably reacted as, as many physicians would. He was very probably anxious and uh, uh, in those situations it's uh, very stressful for anyone, even someone who is ACLS uh, certified. So is that no? He did not act as a well-skilled person trained in advanced cardiac life support? I didn't say that, sir. Okay, well, I asked the question and I'll ask it again. Did Conrad Murray, in your opinion, based on his statements to the police, act like someone well-skilled and well-trained in advanced cardiac life support? I can't make that assessment. I would have done things differently in terms of calling for help and in terms of calling 911. What so would you have done? Immediately I would have called for help, although I understand this was sort of an isolated area and there was, um, it was... Isolated area? of the house, yes, I understand it was a special suite uh, of rooms on... There was a bedroom upstairs. Yeah, but okay. remove... What would you have done? That's what, that was my question. What would you have done? You said you would have called for help. I'd have called for help. I would have initiated, assessed the patient, um, initiated cardiopulmonary resuscitation immediately. And after making an assessment and starting cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, 
if you were in that situation and you knew you had no uh, personnel on hand and none of uh, the uh, resuscitation equipment, uh, wouldn't you call 911? Yes, I would call 911. Okay. But my understanding, if I may, is that this was an unusual situation because this was a house that had a secure perimeter and had no phone lines um, in the house. So it's not a typical situation uh, where you can call 911 and have immediate access to the premises. I would certainly agree this was an unusual situation, but uh, Conrad Murray had a cell phone in his hand by his own statement and used it to call Michael Amir Williams. Are you saying he was not capable of pushing 911, maybe putting the phone down on speakerphone and continuing with the cardiopulmonary resuscitation? It's my understanding that, number one... I'm he, asking your opinion. Okay, my opinion... About what you would do. There was a cell phone. There Conrad was a, Murray used it to call Michael Amir Williams. If you were in that situation, you come on the patient, and he had, he's in full cardiopulmonary arrest, and you assess the patient, <clears throat> and you start resuscitative efforts, uh, and you've called for help, wouldn't you use that cell phone to call 911 as quickly as possible? Yes, but in calling 911, you need to know the address. Um, you would uh, need to be able to make sure they could access the the premises. And my understanding is, is it, let me do, so is it your testimony because there was a gate around the house that that excuses Conrad Murray not calling 911? Is that your testimony? Because you've mentioned this gate a couple times now. No, it doesn't. It doesn't at all. It's okay. Then why you, okay. Then. We can set aside the gate, right? Because that has no bearing on Conrad Murray's need to call 911 as soon as possible, correct? Well, I think that's the reason he called the security individual, uh, Michael Amir, uh, to inform him that he needed um, uh, emergency medical assistance. Okay. And you realize when he called Michael Amir Williams, uh, he didn't tell Michael Will Amir Williams to summon emergency medical assistance. You do realize that, don't you? If that's what you say, yes. Okay. Wouldn't you agree that it's much quicker to call 911 than to call uh, someone's personal cell phone number, have it ring through to voicemail, and then leave a message on that voicemail? Wouldn't you think it would be much quicker to simply call 911 and even put the phone on speakerphone and continue with your resuscitation? Wouldn't you agree with that? Well, you can have people on speed dial and call them even faster than 911. So I, I think certainly 911 is easy to dial. You're absolutely right. Um, so there's no justification for what Conrad Murray did in failing to immediately call 911, is there? I, as I said earlier, I think he should have called 911 sooner. I do not, however, think it would have made any difference in the outcome of this case. Now, you commented, let's strike that. After you, if you personally <coughs> came, came upon Michael Jackson in that state where a pulse was felt um, and you assessed the patient and you started resuscitative efforts, how long would it take you to decide uh, in that setting, in a bedroom, in a home, that you needed to call 911? Are you saying if I, if I felt a pulse? Well, Conrad Murray said he felt a pulse, yes, so that's what I'm saying. He said he felt a thready, a thready pulse. Uh, which... He said he checked the pulse oximeter, and it read 122, and then he felt the femoral pulse, and he felt a, a thready pulse, correct. In that situation, if you came upon those facts, how long would it take you to decide that you should call 911? Well, again, if I came upon that situation and I was ACLS certified and a cardiologist, I would immediately start resuscitating the patient um, and call 911 shortly thereafter. What's shortly thereafter? Was, you know, f three to five minutes, I would guess, if you ask me for a number. In this type of situation uh, where uh, paramedics are eventually called and they arrive on the scene, 
doesn't a doctor have a, a moral and ethical obligation to reveal all medicines to that responding emergency personnel that have been given to the patient that could affect the treatment? I think in general we try to recount all the events, but in an emergency situation, as happens in hospital environments uh, as well, it's often difficult to require to recall details in, in that kind of situation. Is it your testimony that uh, the failure to mention propofol to the paramedics was an inability to recall details? Is that your testimony, Dr. White? Well, I'm just saying we details can be overlooked. I don't think, I'm not saying it's appropriate, I'm not saying, but I don't think it was done in a devious uh, fashion. You think, so I just want to be clear, you think it was just a detail that was overlooked when Conrad Murray failed to advise paramedics he had been administering propofol. Is that your testimony? It was a detail that was overlooked? I don't think I used those words. Um, propofol, a small dose of propofol, I'm not, could not be reversed. It's okay. not like benzodiazepines. Do you understand my question to ask you if propofol could be reversed? Is that how you construed my question? Is that how you construed my question? No. That okay, I, then please listen to the question and please try to answer my question. Is it your testimony that Conrad Murray's failure to inform the paramedics that he had administered propofol was a, simply a detail that had been overlooked. Is that your testimony? I think it was something that he overlooked. Okay. Yes. Having time to ponder it and think about it and ride along in the uh, paramedics vehicle while Michael Jackson lay on a gurney uh, and then arriving at UCLA, uh, was it still then another detail that he overlooked at UCLA when the emergency room doctors specifically asked him uh, what had taken place? Is that your testimony, that that again was a detail that was overlooked? Well, it was obviously overlooked. He didn't, he didn't well, tell them. Well, not obviously. It could also be a lie, correct? Correct? That's another option. Uh, if you say so, I guess, yeah. That's another option, correct? It's an option, yes. Thank you. Now, you said in your report, uh, Dr. White, that, um, that in your opinion this was, uh, as you said here today, cardiopulmonary arrest, and you characterized it as um, that the central nervous system depressant effects of this combination of medications can produce significant ventilatory depressant effects as well as upper airway obstruction parentheses, due to relaxation of the pharyngeal musculature, correct? You mentioned a report. I didn't actually write a report. Uh, I wrote a letter. Are you referring to the letter to Mr. Flanagan? This is the only thing I was ever given, so whatever you want to call it. This three-and-a-half-page document was the only thing I ever received from you. Did you want to call this a letter or a report? It was a letter. Okay, this is the only thing I have. So uh, this was what documents your findings, correct? No, not at all. Is there some other information, uh, reports you've given to the defense that you didn't provide to me? Not in writing, no. But I've certainly conveyed my evaluation of materials uh, to the um, counsel um, over the phone and in personal What do you want to refer to this as, a letter or a report? I think it's a letter. Containing your findings at the time uh, regarding this case, correct? It contains some preliminary thoughts on this case, yes. And this is the only document you've ever provided, is a document that contains preliminary thoughts? Correct. And in this letter containing your preliminary thoughts, you state that um, it was likely acute cardiopulmonary arrest where the central nervous system depressant effects of this combination of medications can produce significant ventilatory depressant effects as well as upper airway obstruction, correct? I don't have the document before me, but it sounds, sounds like something I may have written, yes. Would you agree that the risk of adverse drug reactions increases when combinations of sedative and analgesic drugs are administered? When combinations of sedative and analgesic drugs are administered, yes, I would. 
and that the potential for compromising the respiratory system results from depression of uh, esophageal and laryngeal reflexes, upper airway obstruction, and depression of central hypercarbic and hypoxic ventilator responses. Would you agree with that statement? Correct. And although uh, in uh, benzodiazepines may be used as an appropriate, uh, uh, I guess, um, procedure of sedation or anesthesia, anesthesia uh, you're well aware of the contributory effect that these drugs can have and that it increases potentially the dangers of what is being administered. Would you agree with that? You were earlier referring to sedative analgesic. That's very different than just talking about sedatives. Um, I'm not aware of studies that have looked at the effects of prior benzodiazepine administration on ventilatory response to propofol, for example. Is it your testimony that the prior administration of, for example, lorazepam and midazolam, uh, is it your testimony that does not increase, increase the risk in any way to respiratory failure? As I stated earlier, it depends on the time interval following their administration. When so, there, so there is a risk, but it depends on other factors. But there is a risk, correct? There is potentially a risk, um, but it's only theoretical, and it depends on or it assumes that that time interval is fairly short and the blood levels of the benzodiazepine are high. You said it's a, a theoretical risk, but you opined on Friday that because, uh, in your opinion, Michael Jackson swallowed lorazepam pills and then quickly injected propofol, that he essentially killed himself, correct? I suggested that one of the possibilities is that there was a high concentration of lorazepam, which I believe was measured at autopsy, and if one then uh, administered very rapidly um, propofol, you could achieve a cardiorespiratory arrest. Uh, certainly an arrhythmia could occur and, uh, and, and this could result in very uh, rapid demise of a patient. Who's responsible for bringing propofol into Michael Jackson's home in your opinion? Well, Conrad Murray certainly purchased propofol, but I understand Mr. Jackson had his own supply as well. Really? Correct. Where is that in the police interview uh, by Conrad Murray? Well, I had heard that... Um, Objection. Okay. Non-responsive. Where is that in Just the police moment, interview? Just please. Sustain. The last partial answer is stricken. You, you keep throwing out these uh, uh, kind of rehearsed lines, I, I think. Uh, my question is, where is that? Just a moment, please. Objection, this argument. Sustained. Please. Ask, ask a proper question. Thank you. Where in Conrad Murray's statement to the police is that reflected? I'm not, I don't have the report in front of me. I reviewed it, it in, in uh, February. And as I indicated, I've had two lengthy Objection, conversations. Objection, motion to strike. Would the court admonish the witness? The objection is sustained. The answer stricken. Disregard, please. May I ask a favor, ladies and gentlemen, if you could just leave us for a few moments, please? Remember the admonishments. Don't get too comfy. I'm just going to ask that you go into the jury. Thank you.